Beowulf Sheehan is a photographer of portraiture and performance in the arts. His work has appeared internationally, including in Esquire, The New Yorker, Time, Vanity Fair, and Vogue, and at the Museum of the City of New York, the Dostoevsky Museum, and the International Center of Photography. He lives in New York City. We are in Brattleboro, Vermont, to talk about his freshly published beautiful book called Author, The Portraits of Beowulf Sheehan, with a foreword by Salman Rushdie, published by Black Dog Leventhal Publishers. Welcome to The Bibliophile. Well, thank you so much, Nigel. It's great to be here and have a chance to chat with you. This must be a thrill to actually publish a beautiful book the way that so many of the people that you've photographed over the years do. Absolutely. I've photographed better than 800 writers from goodness, I was easily better than 45, 50 countries thus far in my career. And to have the chance to join them on the shelf and add to posterity is no small thrill. It allows you, I guess, to empathize to a greater degree with them? Without question. Going through that experience? Prior to the publication of Author, just on Tuesday past, I had never sat down for a book signing, of course, of a book of my own. Uh I've never been on book tour. I've certainly presented my work here and there, but never in this capacity, and it's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. It's demanding, uh, but answering the demands of uh, the needs of a book is a calling everybody should be uh, fortunate enough to have if Mm -hmm. they can. Mm -hmm. Your dad gave you a book by the photographer Helmut Newton, his autobiography. Yes. Uh, what did that book teach you? Well, I'd certainly known Helmut Newton's work for some time. I'm, I'm as much a lover of the, the artistic medium as I am a student of it and a practitioner of it. And my mother, I should say, is from Hamburg, Germany. So I was all, already enamored with German photographers. And Helmut Newton, of course, is perhaps among the more renowned in, in recent century uh, of photographic history. So I knew his story to some degree. But what the book gave me was a message of love for my father more than anything else because I grew up practicing creative things. Uh, I, I read a great deal as a child and I, as a boy, had asthma and couldn't join in reindeer games with all the other school children, if you will, such that instead of playing sports, I would read. And reading led to my then, at the time, reading comic books, my then drawing those comic book characters and little stories of my own, working my way up to Choose Your Own Adventure and to Jack London books and, and the Mary Shelley and H.G. Wells books of the world, uh, Frank Herbert books, if you will, and then working my way up to um, more challenging and uh, more complex stories from there. But I don't know that to that point I had actually read the memoir of a photographer. But for all the creative things I did, uh, taking characters from books, drawing them, and now at this stage of my life for the last 10 plus years, taking not the characters from the stories, but the storytellers and celebrating them in pictures that I make with a camera rather than with my hands. There's no small irony in that Mm -hmm. because I'm to some large degree doing what I did as a child. And Mm -hmm. I was in love with it then and I'm in love with it now. Mm -hmm. The context is different, the means are different, the results are different, but the storyline of the experience is very similar. And these aren't fictitious characters in novels. They are, of course, human beings who give us the gifts of stories. And among the greatest things that a culture can impart from one generation to the next that are necessary for the, for the, maintain, for the maintenance of that culture and, and the perpetuity of ourselves as a people, as a society, of course, is storytelling. We have language, we have location, but it is the narrative of who we are that makes and informs life from one generation to another, uh, from family and beyond, then as we go out in the world and we expand our circles. For me to do what I do in celebration of the people who make that happen is no small thrill. It is my life's, my professional life's honor. For me to have received that book at a time when I had been through my adolescent years and my early 20s years doing things at the behest of my father that didn't really interest me professionally. I studied as an undergraduate student something that I didn't care about, uh, about, sorry, about which I didn't care. I should worry about Mm. language in this field. Uh, And then I worked in a field that had its creative ends, but my work in it was not necessarily that creative. What was that? 
I actually was working in the finance department of a modeling agency, okay. which meant that I was around photography almost every day. Right. But I didn't see it as my path, even though I had photographed through high school to some end in college. I didn't see it as my path. I wanted to be involved in the visual arts somehow, but my father wanted me to be in finance, so I had acquiesced for a while. Mm. And it's always a mistake. And yet, for the challenge of the time lost, one could argue, it gave me the opportunity to see a different side of how business and how life and how the world works. Did you resent your father because of it? Sure. Of course, yeah. that's natural. Yeah, yeah. And, and I certainly did. And yet I couldn't deny what it was that was going on inside me that I loved. But I also mm. couldn't put my finger on it. I knew that there was something in the visual that would speak to me and I would find my joy in it. And my thought for a long time was that given that I have now this business acumen, strong words, but a few years in business essentially saying, uh, working with clients from around the world and, and learning language and, and culture and, and just how to provide a need to someone and how to, to settle that experience and move on to the next. Uh, that's the greater part of what the business, quote unquote, had given experience had given to me, yeah. but there was still the desire to to do something. My thought was to marry that experience with my love of the visual arts and perhaps become a gallerist. If I can't be an artist myself, then I'll support others. Yeah. Maybe I could find celebrate some, others. Maybe I could find some happiness in that. And I therefore studied at New York University, getting a master's degree in visual arts management thinking that's my path. Okay. But, and you know what? It's, that's what your 20s are for anyways. Sure, sure. Is sort of farting around a bit, trying this, trying yeah, that, yeah. getting some education. Well, and well beyond your 20s too. I'll yeah. come to an anecdote that you're, you're touching on. Um, but in my second year of graduate school, I had one elective that I could take, and I thought, well, I've painted, I've sculpted, I've photographed. I've never made a print. Hmm. So I'll make a print. I'll take a printmaking class, see what's going on in the dark room. And on that first day, I came out of that class thinking, you love this. You knew you were it's, doing the right thing. There's something here that really, really excites you, and you've got to respond to that. And it took some time, I think, from my having finished at NYU, and then I went to ICP thereafter at night for What's a year. ICP? International Center of Photography. It okay. is the United States' largest private institution for the study of photography and only photography, although it's expanded to mm -hmm. digital media now. What did you learn from that book, though? The so the book. Yeah. Is there anything coming back to the book? So uh, shortly after my finishing at ICP, and then paying my dues behind a desk for someone else for some time, I, ha I could not deny that passion any longer, and I endeavored nights and weekends while still having a desk job for someone else, 50, 60 hours a week. I, I was in the dark room or I was photographing nights and weekends, nonstop, trying to learn things, figure things out, and, and, uh, and grow beyond the classroom, of the classroom and, and instead the classroom of experience. And when I went for it, I had to, of course, tell my parents. And my father surprised me by saying something to the effect that you'll never know if you love it or not and if you can do it or not if you don't give yourself this experience. And then it wasn't long thereafter that that book arrived. Okay. And, and on the introductory page reserved for the title and the author's name, uh, I believe the book was called Autobiography, Helma Dearden. Uh, my father had written in so many words, uh, Dear Bayo, I've taken the liberty of reading this book to better understand the journey you're about to take. Love, Dad. So it was what your dad wrote more than what Newton wrote. Yes, absolutely. Because those words were all I needed. I knew okay. with them that I had my father's support. My father, of course, had for years and years pushed me in a direction I did not want to go. And part of a parent's responsibility, of course, well, the greatest responsibility and absolute responsibility is to love that child. But also the responsibility is to encourage that child to find out what he or she loves and, and to go for it. If you want your son to be that doctor or whatever the field might be, if that's not for him or her, you have to, of course, accept that. And that was, that my, that was my father's letter of acceptance. What I learned from Helmut Newton was what I had told myself, but needed perhaps oftentimes a little encouragement to, to believe. He'd said several times that if you're reading this book because you have dreams of being a fancy pants photographer and having a glamorous life and all kinds of money and, and celebratory, lavish things, that's not going to happen. You should never, never, never get into a creative field, certainly photography, for whatever financial gain might come from it. I'm one of the lucky ones. Keep Indeed. reading. 
if you're okay with that. And he said it more than once. And that was really important of him to say because I dove into it because I loved it. Mm-hmm. I how, felt that weight of that desire in my, on my shoulders and I, I had to embrace it. Had I never taken the leap, I wouldn't know what would have become with, yep. of that desire. And my goodness, on November 4th, I will be 14 years old as a full-time photographer. I was part-time for six years say, doing the things I'd shared with you. And what a wonderful ride it's been. And that is now uh, made concrete in a book in front of you. And a beautiful book it is, too. Thank you. I want to talk about your role as the, a photographer of authors. What makes photographing authors different from photographing politicians or sports stars or business people? Every public image is promoting something. Fashion image, for example, however creative, as I alluded to in my talk earlier tonight, is ultimately selling that clothing that's adorning the model or the product that the model is alongside, whatever the case may be. And I found out early in my career, trying to find my way, that I wasn't so drawn to what it was that was being promoted, but I was really interested in the story of that person. And of course, in the case of those works in, in the fashion world, the person story, that, that model's story, isn't as important to the client as whatever it is he or she is wearing. And yet, I had from time to time made pictures of musicians and young actors. I, I'm growing with everybody around me, of course. And I was fascinated with their journeys. And of course, uh, the work of a writer is to make public the private, which is that person's journey. Here I am, and I'm telling you my story through a work of fiction or through my fascination in this person's life, now a biography that I'm publishing. Fiction, nonfiction, poetry, drama, whatever the, the genre of the art of letter might be, each person has a story within him or her that needs to get out. Just as I had a, this innate desire to make images, that person ha- has this desire that he or she can't deny, Mm. to tell a story. Thank Thank goodness those people are in the world. Imagine a world without stories and storytellers. It would be quite bleak. So what makes them different, though, in in the the photographing of them? Yes, is that I need to celebrate them, not what they're wearing, not what they're promoting. And yes, they're promoting a book, but that book is an extension of themselves. With someone trying to win an office and therefore needs promotional photographs, the photographs are meant to help people win. And the hope is then that they'll be in service to the, to the public. My wish is to create excitement about that person's story. Every book has two images, ideally, on its external body. The cover, of course, is an image laden with text. And then within the uh, book jacket or perhaps on the back cover is a portrait then of that artist who's made that book. Those are the two chances to get somebody so excited about him or her, and my responsibility then is to celebrate that person. Yes, so do you have the, to... And so further to your question then, the idea of what makes a writer different from, from an actor, uh, from a politician, from an athlete, those latter characters are part of something greater. An actor is usually photographed to help promote a film that involves thousands of people. Mm-hmm. Even though if the storyline on the screen features one, two, three, four people, there's still hundreds, if not thousands, of people involved in that production, depending on the scale of it. A political effort to win a seat, at least in this country's a political system, the, involves the work of hundreds of people, and then thousands of volunteers on that as the, the seat grows. And yes, no one goes alone, alone in the work of literature as well. There's an editor, and beyond the editor, of course, is the publisher, and there are publicity people behind that team and, and there's someone conceiving of a cover art and, and on and on and, and I've learned through my own journey how many people are involved and mm-hmm. many people who contributed to a work who I didn't meet until the book was out that sort of thing wow yeah. wow 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 uh, but, but it all starts it, but it all starts with that one voice but how does that inform your photograph versus you know you're photographing a businessman who wants to get a, a raise sure. let's say sure. or get a better job what are you doing with your photograph for that author? What are you looking to get for them? I'm looking to get people excited about their work. And I want people to, I want people to stop and see that photograph and say, wow, who is this? They want, you want to make it look like they've got an interesting story inside Absolutely. these covers. Yes. And 
In portraiture, you can be one of two things. With everything in life, you can be one of two things. You can either be proactive or reactive. So with someone who doesn't know what the story is that needs to be told in that photograph, then the photographer has to be proactive. In other words, okay, welcome to my studio, person running for Office X. I want to cast you in a good light. Let's turn you here, turn you there, da 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 And then we'll put around you the U.S. flag or whatever the content may be to get uh, that person... Um, hopefully uh, a seat at the table in whatever government, house government that might be, fine. But with a writer, I'm not asking the person to just walk in and I make a, a hopefully a nicely lit photograph. With the writer, my job is to be reactive rather than proactive and then work with that person together to come up with an image. The reactive part of it for me is to have read the work. From that work, I get a sense of that person's aesthetic, what it is he or she has to say to the world, and hopefully, through whatever little metaphor I can con of which I can conceive, we can then make a picture that relates directly to the story and at the same time speaks compellingly to who that person is. Let's have some very specific examples of that. Sure. So there are then, I should qualify, to my experience, there is a commercial and an editorial image to be made. A commercial image will be a little more safe, if you will. Just That's what the client it. asks you to do, typically? But typically, yes. So yeah. the, the, another way to put it is the, the picture that the client wants and the pictures that I want to make. Because if the book is going to receive enough attention, there will be an interest in more than just the photograph of that person be made between the shoulders, so to speak. For the, for the duck jacket. Right, yeah. right. And yet sometimes, the and my wish come true is always when that editorial image becomes the author portraiture. Yeah. <laughs> because we, we live in a world today in which no matter where we are, if we're in a place that is in any way busy or we carry with us these smartphones, we are inundated with imagery. Mm -hmm. Whether we want to be or not, we'll see hundreds of photographs in a single day, not by choice, just part of our landscape, depending upon, again, our society, which means that we become all the more desensitized to photographs, such that we'll pass perhaps something compelling by. But then the definition of compelling has to change because I want that passerby to stop and really pay attention to the photograph I've made of somebody whose work I want to celebrate. Anything I can do to make a picture that's a little bit different because of that comment that we live in a world that we, uh, that's so oversaturated with imagery these days, to make anything that's a little separated from the pack will naturally stop someone. Mm -hmm. That is normal. We, we very rarely respond to the commonplace, but we always respond to something that's new, something that's novel. So let's get some very specific examples of uh, an author whose work you've read, you've identified an important message that they want to get out to the world, Yes, and you've translated that into a photograph. So in my photograph of Leslie Jameson, for example, made last August 2017, uh, Leslie had in the beginning of this year published a memoir called The Recovering, and it is about her experience as an alcoholic, and at the same time a, a work that shares the history of alcoholism through the founding of AA and that founder's journey and also the alcoholism of writers of note through history. How do you put the idea of alcoholism into a picture? Yeah, you can't, have, you can't have them holding a, a beer bottle. No, 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 no. And the obvious then becomes the cliche and, beget, and isn't noticed. So the image that you see of Leslie Jameson in my book is that of her wearing this beautiful silk flowery dress. Where is She's that? very elegant. Uh, she is on a splash page. By splash page, I mean a two-page spread. Here she is on the right, and her husband, Charles Bach, is on the left. Okay. So for those who don't know the relationship, you still have the, the graphic homage of these lovely autumn leaves in the background uh, behind Charles Bach and his image on the left, and he has on his blue t-shirt a horse of multiple colors. Uh, a series of colors that make up the icon of, a, I believe, a leaping horse, which then balance very well against the image of Leslie Jameson, in which she's wearing this full-length, long sleeve silky dress, black with multiple flowers radiating across it before a brick wall. Yeah. The brick wall is without color. It is not uh, the red of brick, but rather the gray of brick, meaning that it's, it, it is made to look like brick, it is carved like it, but it might be concrete. Okay, so how, do you, how does that say addiction? We have around her the cutout of a door. Even though it looks as if the wall continues and is made to look that way, there is actually a door of the same content as the wall immediately behind her. And what is it 
to give in to or to resist an addiction, but to walk through that door. That door to an alcoholic, to an addict of any kind, is always open and can't wait for you to open it up and go in. You mean back into it? Back into it, absolutely. Right, right. Okay. So the way to survive as, as an alcoholic is to acknowledge the presence of that door, but keep it behind you and keep it closed. And it's kind of bricked up. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And yet the door is clear. That is, she is before a door is obvious to the viewer. That's interesting. That is the perpetual daily challenge of an addict of any kind. So that was your idea? Absolutely. That's fascinating. And she accepted the proposal, and here we are. If the idea isn't embraced by the writer, then of course I'm not going to make the picture. Yeah, okay. And of course this, isn't, this is your editorial. This isn't what the client wants, necessarily. The client, what does the client typically ask you for? Is it like the, They wouldn't just say, give me a head and shoulders, because anyone can do that. You must be able to do them sure. better than other people. Well, I'll, I'll leave that, <laughs> that observation to be decided by others. Uh, by the last census of its kind, New York City had 8,000 photographers. And granted, we're a city of 3 million people Monday through fi- uh, sorry, Saturday and Sunday, and I think we're well over 3 million Monday through Friday if you count the, the professional tra- the traffic that comes, and I think we push 8 million uh, with transitory workers, that sort of thing, which is mind-boggling. So that I should get the call over anyone else leads me to say I'm honored to have had the career I've had that I've been able to do this full-time for 14 years, just shy of 14 years, is no small miracle. Yeah. But you've, you've obviously developed a reputation as an author photographer. Yes. But uh, what I'm saying is they don't ask for a boring head and shoulders shot. No, 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 no. But, but, yeah, but I, I recognize know that that you, is required. Yeah, and you can be kind of disappointed in that because you don't sure. really want to do that. Sure. But they need I, it, I guess. It, it's absolutely needed. Yeah. It's absolutely needed. So again, getting the idea of no matter what we do in life, our job is to make those who engage us to do something happy. It doesn't matter what the position is. That is that is a profession. You do what you're asked to do well, you make someone happy. And then hopefully you're asked by someone else to make that person happy. And on and on and on and on and on. You want to make yourself happy too, and that's where the absolutely. editorial comes in. I absolutely, guess. absolutely. Right. And so when I'm given that opportunity to act on a dream that I might have in my head, for that person that speaks to that person's work and to that person, wonderful. And if I can make that small dream come true, fantastic. Mm. Isn't that a great thing? Yeah. Isn't that a great thing? And on some level, a novel is someone's dream put to paper. Let's have another couple of examples because sure. that, was, that was really interesting. Thank you. So let's go back to where would he be? There's a writer here by the name of Scott Shesher, and I hope I can find him for you relatively quickly. It's okay, I can edit I'll, it. I'll tell you about him as, as I find the page. Scott had... Oh, is that Nicholson Baker in there? Yes, that is yeah, Nicholson Baker yeah, there. Yeah, he's very photogenic. I, I, very I, I even man. took a good photograph of him. His, his, yeah. his beard is better than that of Santa Claus. <laughs> let's see if I can find that image. Sorry for not recalling in what page it is. <laughs> no problem. It's a thi- How many pages in the book? <coughs> I think there are better... Here we are. I think it's better than 260 pages, but there are 200 photographs of okay. 200, exactly 200 writers from 35 countries. And I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that a good percentage of the world is represented mm-hmm. in this work. That's important to me, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, to show that uh, we are as diverse as we are harmonious. Mm-hmm. Not homogenous, but rather in touch with each other and in need of each other. We, and that we accomplish things such as publishing a book together. Nothing of great importance is done by any one singular person. However, history might tell us otherwise. That is absolutely not the truth. So we're looking at a photograph of Scott Shesher here on the left who had written a novel about a young man coming of age whose parents were um, evangelically uh, devout, such that he grew up in their world. And as he reached his teenage years, then this character realized that there was another world out there. And he was keen to explore it and found himself being really drawn to it and less interested in the world of his parents and then the world of, of that religious community in which they had lived. So the, the novel explores that push and pull of two different communities. And I then thought, well, of course, one community is that of a faith. And of course, that faith involves the ideas of miracles and, and on and on, such that I thought, um, I wonder if there's a way I can come up with a photograph that speaks to having one foot in one world and one foot in another. So I took a, an extended walk around the neighborhood found this location, proposed the idea to Scott, and Scott said, let's go for it. So this location 
as I'm describing a photograph, is that of a wall. It's, this is a brick wall and a colored brick wall, but it is a black and white image in which there is an impression about the size of a door frame in the wall, yet there is no door and there is no hallway beyond what looks like a door frame. It is also covered by brick. And the base of that door frame is perhaps a good five to six feet above the ground. And what I asked Scott to do was to step out of that frame and take a, a literal leap of faith. On the day that we photographed, Scott was still into it, and as fate would have, and I detail this in my essay, there was a mattress on the block. This is New York City, this is the Lower East Side of New York City, and you'll always find interesting souvenirs on the sidewalks of New York City. I often tell people the best way to experience New York City is to look out, look up, but don't look down. <laughs> um, and at times it's okay to look down. Mm -hmm. We saw that mattress and figured perfect. Now he has something on which to land, and Scott refused that something. He said, no worries, I'll just step out. I said, but you're going to drop six feet. I need you to land on something soft. Or I need you to roll. Yeah, if you, I don't if you, you know what you're doing, yourself, don't, yeah. don't go straight down. Yeah. No, 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 I got this, I got this, let's do it. We knew that we would only have one take. And I photographed him at perhaps a five thousandth of a second or so, so that he'd be sharp. And lo and behold, we have an image in which he has one foot flat on this vertical wall and one foot mm -hmm. parallel to the floor in the air. But looking at the photograph, Beowulf, yes. it looks like he's walking on air. Yes. You know, it's almost a religious... Yes. yes, and that's the point. Yeah. So it really worked. Mm -hmm. And we then made a few more looks, and then we said our goodbyes. And about two weeks or so later, I had already delivered uh, the author portrait, and I had liked this picture so much that I thought I'd make a print of it and give it to him to say thank you. So I paid him a visit, and he was expecting me, of course. And when I opened the door, I found out that Scott was walking with one foot on the ground and the other foot on a rolling stool of some kind because he had broken his ankle. <laughs> and you didn't say, I told you so. And he didn't tell me anything about it, yeah. of course. And so I thought, oh, well, there goes my career. And I suppose I'll get a summons and then <laughs> that's how life goes sometimes in our society. And he could not have been more graceful. He said to me that uh, I have a lot of reading and writing to do and now there's nothing I can do but read and write. Yeah, so he's thanking you. You thank me. You thank me. <laughs> you mentioned in your talk earlier this this afternoon that I don't know if you said if it was a it was a maybe it was a break for you, the Donna Tart. Would you say that was that that was a huge absolute thing for you? It was maybe a tremendous could, opportunity for me. Yeah. Okay. Maybe you could uh, describe that because it's sure. So neat. Absolutely. So Donna Tart has written three novels thus far in her career. Each took about a decade to write. So The Goldfinch was her first novel in 11 years, and her third novel overall. And her agent had given me a call and asked me if I knew her and her work, and I said certainly. And that Donna had been reviewing the websites of a few photographers and had decided she'd like to hire me to make her author portrait. That was her decision? Yes, absolutely. As well it should be. Yeah. I don't think a, a photographer should ever be chosen by someone other, at least not without the consent of the, the subject because this but isn't it typically the publisher that makes the decision publishers make recommendations I would say and, okay. and depending upon the writer the publisher attends, attends to the cost but if there's not that comfort mm -hmm. with that person and also then the confidence in that person's work to deliver that will go on to show of course in the image so I'm I, I'm very grateful that she thought of so much of me as to ask me to make her author portrait, of course. She didn't even know you, though. She just liked your images. From my site. That's correct. Right. We had not yet met. Okay. So okay. then from there, of course, I wanted to dive in. Knowing that I had a few weeks lead time, I then wanted to have the opportunity to read her work. Well, The Goldfinch was anticipated to do quite well. And given the nature of Donna's being a less than public figure, if you will, and having not presented a work to the world in some years and having a tremendous following, that request was declined. I therefore said, no worries, I understand, and may we just speak, which we did. So I had a lovely talk with Donna, and she had shared with me excerpts of what the story would involve just by speaking mm -hmm. with me, mm -hmm. and she asked me to reread The Secret History to get a sense of her aesthetic. And from that talk, I learned a great deal of, about her. I always ask a writer how, it is, how that person wishes to be seen. 
And I would say the most common response I get is that I wish to be seen as a serious writer. Fair enough. Donna's response was, I see myself as a dandy. I'm a dandy, so I'll leave you to run with that. And that's exactly what I did. So having read the work, and, and if, have you read The Goldfinch? No, I haven't, no. So the landscape of it is gritty New York City, but it's also palm-treed Las Vegas. It is the Netherlands. It's many things, but it is also, uh, it's about love, and it's about art. It's about the relationship between the two, and also the place of each in the world. It's an ultimately very beautiful book, and yet it begins with the, the death of someone's mother by way of a terrorist bombing of the Metropolitan Museum, and then that the son of that mother not having a paternal presence in New York City and an estranged father in Las Vegas, et cetera, et cetera. It's, uh, it's amazing, but there's then the things that happen around that relationship, the moving on from the loss of the mother, the theft of the goldfish finch painting, Fabricius's painting, they ha have a certain texture to it, and she details it so well. There's a grittiness to it. Uh, there's a noir quality to it. And so I tried to think of where could I possibly go to speak to those kinds of uh, aesthetics. And lo and behold, the winning photograph is made in the Lower East Side in a parking lot. Because it's gritty? Yes, and it spoke to her. If it doesn't speak to her, we, we would not have photographed there. And of course, this is the picture as we're it's looking on at the, the cover. We're looking at the cover photograph. This is the picture that was there for the, the back cover of the Goldfinch. Most other portraits, of course, go on the inside flat. Uh, but this was so uh, regarded by her UK and US publishers that in those countries and in others... Was that Little Brown? Little Brown, that's correct. Yeah, okay. Uh, that it became back cover. And I was elated. Now, there are other images that you will see. Of her, yeah. Of her. And so this image on the left where we see her in front of a boarded up series of windows or doors at a at an, an absent stair or fire escape I suppose is the right you, term. You like bricked up uh, doorways don't you? It's interesting um, I've photographed in front of some that motif a few times but oddly enough Scott Cheshire's picture and Donna Tartt's picture were made in the same year and I'm quite sure those are the only two times I had this as a motif. <laughs> okay so it's just coincidence. Yes but how did this so she thought this was brilliant. Yeah, because it, there's such an interesting contrast between that sort of grubby wall yes. and the and the iron stairway cases yes. on it, and her lovely, elegant sh uh, shirt that's white with black stripes, and yes. she's wearing a, a almost like a dinner jacket. And the gentle lift of her hair, yes, so beautiful. There's yes. this, this this light poetry against the very stark. You could see this image of rendered black and white. It, it, it could easily be a 1950s movie poster, detective kind of poster. And I feel that, that pulp, that, that film noir sensibility in this image. And it's so much her energy. She's just tremendous that way. And I was very, very drawn to that. So again, it was a, in the novel, it's a, there's yes. a grittiness, there's yes. a noir element. Yes. And those are the two key yes. features that you wanted yes. to capture. There's an urbanity of it. So the, the there are multiple threads, but there is the journey of the main character, his name's Theo, having lost his mother and having to find a new family. He is taken in uh, by someone, and, and that someone's family is well-to-do, and it's a different socioeconomic culture, but he also finds then someone in the West Village uh, who is not family, but uh, someone who's curious about him and, and who he is also curious about, but that is a that is more of a mentor-mentee relationship. And at the same time, through the devastation of the museum and all, and all these artifacts therein being uh, obliterated by the bomb, there is Corel Fabricius's The Goldfinch, and he takes it and puts it in his backpack. And it's just this knee-jerk thing that happens. Not to say that he's a thief or a bad person, but he did it. And of course, in the accounting for the treasures lost by the museum, they realize that that painting was missing suddenly begins, begins this worldwide manhunt, if you will, for the work. And that involves then in time the Russian underworld and less than, how should we say, 
uh, professional people. So when this was this, all this running through your mind then when you were when you were first of all searching out your that's right. locations. Lo locations, yes. And did you ask her to dress up like that, or just no, just was all no, no, serendipity no, no, no. then? This all came comes to the notion of her being a dandy. I didn't. She just I, yeah, because she I, she said I I've got my wardrobe. <laughs> I I know me, and I yeah. and I say to every writer when asked, well, what should I wear? I said, you're an adult. You have a sense of what favorite pieces are most you. If we're to make anything that approaches a genuine portrait, because we're all, we are all every emotion at some point in our lives. We can be as ugly as we can be beautiful. We can be everything, and we are everything. That's part of the human experience. So I can't make a single photograph that says, this is all of you. No it's one can. It's just you at that time. That's right. But I can make a photograph that's, that should say, and I hope does say, this is part of you. And as you say, yes, you at that time. Mm -hmm. To the So I encourage every person who uh, sits down with me to bring his or her favorite pieces. And for Donna, that was easy. <laughs> well, I, I don't know about that. She may have a gigantic wardrobe. She did bring but, a fair size wardrobe. Yeah, and we, yeah. we wore plenty of different pieces. Okay. Through, yes. Okay. I, I've sort of touched on this before, but what does the publisher, the client usually ask for? Wow. <laughs> the client usually asks for a picture that is um, that's commercially viable. I mean, that's, uh, I think you say in, is it in, in, in English English where you say that's the rub? Yeah. That's a hard thing to quantify, but mm -hmm. that's what I'm tasked with. And I, of course, don't want to make the same picture. And I think if you look through this book, we've got better than 200 photographs. No two are exactly alike. However, there are certainly harmonies among them, and that's why they're paired that way. Uh, but for me to make something unique about each one is among my challenges. I've been asked this same question so many different ways. Make a picture that will get someone excited by the book. Make a picture that makes the person look younger. Make, a person, make the person look mature. Serious, as you said. Yes. When I look back at all the different ways I've been asked, the question is, is really the same. The phrasing change is sure, but the, the request is, make the person look as wonderful as you can. Yeah. To the point that people will stop and say, wow, who's that? And they're really interesting, and they must have written a good book. I hope, <laughs> I hope that's what they take away from that knee-jerk response. Okay. The, the language we speak the quickest is that of the visual, of course. Yeah, that's the one that, that obviously yes. hits you right away. Yes. I just want to reference the fact sure. that uh, Vanessa Vaselka is in the book, a photograph of her. Yes. And uh, she has a tattoo, which is terrific. It's yes. the Fortitude Lion from the New York Public Library yes. on her right shoulder. Yes. With the Library of Congress catalog number of her book underneath yes. it. I just thought That's, that, was, that is brilliant. It's a great tattoo for an author. Yes, yeah. it is. Yes, it is. To my knowledge, yeah. she might be the only one. Yeah. Uh, to my knowledge, she is the only one. But that's pride. And, mm -hmm. and having made this book myself, I've certainly learned how hard it is to make a book. Mm -hmm. When you think that Donna needed 11 years to write hers, that Ron Chernow needed seven years for Grant, and then it's a 60, sorry, sorry, 600 page monolith of a tale. It is, it is a, a labor of love, and uh, why not wear that love on your sleeve? She has to wear sleeveless. Uh, That's right. <laughs> Sorry, metaphorically speaking, a sleeve, yeah. a sleeve for arm, of course, yes. I just want to just quickly sure. run through some of the things that Salman Rushdie says in his introduction. Writers are observers, they're not the observed, and so they're not always the easiest subjects. Sure. Uh, they don't like loss of control, so it's, uh, it's not easy for a creative controller to turn over control to you. So typically it's only a brief surrender, he suggests. Sometimes, yes. The photographer needs a quick, clear eye and knows what he wants, decisive. He needs to earn the trust of the distrustful, stroke the occasional literary ego, and Beowulf's gentle ease brings on the same. Oh my goodness, those are beautiful words by someone I've, I've loved for so long. He, Salman Rushdie has been very, very kind to me uh, for all this time, and I don't know that I would be in this world if not for the doors he's opened for me mm -hmm. many moons ago and continues to do for me. Did he open Pen America for you? That's where you met him? Or? We, we met by way of Pen America and he, he is past president of it and he's founder of the Pen World Voices Festival of International Literature. 
and I'm the photographer of that festival from its very first year. But someone else was asked to photograph the festival, mm -hmm. was unable to make it, and recommended me, and that someone else was a fellow student at ICP. So you must really like them. Oh my goodness, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. But to the thought of control, I never wish to control anyone. And I'm never going to make a successful, successful photograph of anyone if I am controlling. My responsibility yeah. is to share that journey. I want to give in to that person as much as I would like for that person, for lack of a better phrasing, to give in to me. Because things only work if we work together. History teaches us in any facet of, of the spinning of this earth that you can observe as an example. We only move forward if we move forward together. And I'm only going to make, therefore, a successful photograph if you're in tune with me and I'm in tune with you. And one of the great ways you do that is to closely read their work. Yes. It's my way of saying, I give a damn about you. Yeah. I care about you. Mm -hmm. I'm here for you. I've already invested several days, several nights of my time finding out who you are and what it is you have to say. Mm -hmm. Now let's rock a picture that will do just that. No, I like that, that you're, you're investing in them. You're showing that you really do care Absolutely. What, what they have to Absolutely. say. Harper Collins has been good to you. <laughs> Harper Collins has been good to me, yes. Yes, I, I had the experience of photographing a writer for Vogue Nippon, which is a Japanese edition of Vogue back in 2006. That was my first experience with a writer for a magazine, specifically for a high-profile magazine. And following that work, once published, I got a call from HarperCollins asking me what I charged for author portraits, and I asked them to tell me because I hadn't had that experience just yet, uh, certainly not with a high-profile publisher. But HarperCollins has continued to be wonderful with me. Uh, just this past Tuesday, on my publication day, I worked with a writer whose biography of Susan Sontag will come out next September. And that's a writer who's based in the Netherlands. His name is Ben Moser, and the publisher is Echo Press, an imprint of HarperCollins. How about that for timing? And... This has been an especially beautiful year. Making a book is no small task. I've worked very, very hard, and I've learned how demanding making a book is. I've worked to the tune of just about seven days a week on this book in the rush to get everything ready, and once it's in the can, to still work on it. But among the highlights of this year for me professionally was a photo shoot I did for Anthony Bourdain books. And I believe the last book of uh, that beautiful man's imprint, I had the chance to meet him once, but not to photograph him professionally as I would have wanted, was a book called Prisoner. It's the autobiography coming out, I believe, this late January from a journalist for the Washington Post named Jason Rezaian. And he is Iranian. And he was in Iran and taken prisoner uh, by the authorities there on suspicion of being a terrorist. He was a journalist. Mm -hmm. But he was threatened with death, with dismemberment, with assault of his family, of his wife, and he spent 18 months in prison for having committed no crime other than to tell the news of the day. It's a dangerous uh, career. Yes, days. and we made the cover image together, and that was a really beautiful experience. Mm. Really, really beautiful. One of the greatest honors I've, I've had in recent memory. Mm. And uh, I can't wait for the book to, to come out and be read by the world many, many lessons uh, to, to be taken by all of us moving forward in time from his experience. Well, speaking of lessons, let's just wind it down with you talk uh, in your essay in the book, and the book is Author, The Portraits of Beowulf Sheehan. You talk about life lessons that you've learned from reading, but also from interacting with uh, many, no many authors, and yes. they include, if not lessons, then observations including the power of language, agility, empathy, humility, patience, positivity, and vulnerability. And you say that some degree of each needs to be shared to help make a successful portrait. Yes. So perhaps we can just unpack all of those observations. You talk about the power of language. So how does, how does that help you make a successful portrait? I should say that I have the advantage of having grown up as the son of a translator. So my mother had five languages dancing in her head professionally, and that has helped me immensely. And it has been an invaluable gift to me to have had her in my life and, and still have her in my life. Uh, I, I would like to think that I uh, read, write, and speak three languages, German and Spanish being the others, and I have a small familiarity with French and an even smaller familiarity with Italian. But um, Language, 
also tells you so much about the person who speaks it. You get you learn with some safety in in the presumption or the extrapolation of a person's diction, content of words and composition and daily prose and engaging other people where that person is from where he or she is and from doesn't mean a specific place but rather what that person's journey has been what quality of education is there and how eloquently or how aggressively someone can share an ideal that also tells me then that person's aesthetic we live in an, in a planet of infinite cultures and language is a part of a definition of a culture. So the way a person, a person carries him or herself with just language tells me a lot about who he or she is. And a writer, of course, will use his or her own language, of course. Yeah. Knowing their language yes. or knowing what language they speak, yes. get, that informs what you're going to do with the background or the clothing or, or whatever. Not necessarily that, but at least the quality of light because I can sense how... Mediterranean or well, Nordic would, or... That, that would be lovely, but uh, this, this is publishing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, all to say that there's a temperature, metaphorically speaking, in that person's language. It's cold or it's hot. It's bright or it's dark. That's a nice place at which to start. Mm -hmm. I'm going to add from there. And it, if it's not the language, it could be the content. But those different things, they help me see that person. And hopefully when I dive off the platform into the pool of that time together, I'm already, I'm using lots of metaphoric <laughs> language here, mm. uh, but I am being led by that person's words in the right direction, both hopefully technically and creatively. Well, speaking of diving boards, the next one's agility. Agility. So we learn very quickly, certainly in a city like New York City where I'm based, no one has time for anything. So how to make do then when you have minimal resources and the most precious resource we we all share is time mm -hmm. and it's the one thing we never have enough of in what little time i have i therefore need to be dynamic because if my first impression of that person is to see that person this way and by this way i mean how i light from one perspective and it's wrong okay we've got to go to the other side mm -hmm. and if that's wrong okay then we're going to go to the middle or i'm going to go to some place completely different that person's face and body just don't work properly in tungsten light and strobe light. Therefore, we got to go outside because daylight is what reacts best with you. You're most beautiful in this quality of light. Okay, let's get you to that quality of light. I don't necessarily know those things until that person's right in front of me. But they are, they are truisms of each and every one of us. There is a good, for lack of a better phrasing, uh, a good side for all of us. There's a quality of light in which we look our best. And I need to get the person to that place, which means hustle, hustle, hustle. Right, as fast as you can. Yep. Yeah. Empathy, I think we've covered empathy. Yes, I think so too. Uh, what about humility? I suppose I've been very spoiled to have worked for some people of renown, and it's it has led to experiences of people saying, oh my goodness, you've been with this photographer, you, or you've, you've photographed this person of renown, that person, you are whatever compliment might come from there. That's all well and good, but I'm... I'm no different from anybody else. And I've certainly been in the company of very powerful uh, names and faces in the canon of recent literature. People who are thankfully still with us and a few who are no longer. So it's easy then to, to say, well, I'm, I'm this exalted icon who's been in every literary magazine, who's, whose face has been published in every society uh, in, in the West and beyond, to read my work and I'm this I'm therefore this very special person yes you are and so is everyone else everyone has a special story to tell and it's not that you're just lucky because you've put your entire heart and soul into this career that we've all been interested in and hence your work has grown as we've fallen in love with you and you have loved us back through your writing but I need to meet you here and of course this is a, a podcast so you can't see what I'm doing with my hands but my hands are meeting at the same point so that means that I need to be humble to that person, that hum person needs to be humble to me, for lack of a better term, but that's what I'm really looking for. I, I'm a servant to that person, uh, but Do I you don't... you need respect from them? We need to respect each other, sure. Mm -hmm. We're not going to make any good pictures if I don't have that from the start. The yeah. person communicates to me that here, that that, that, that person's not interested to be there well it'll show and i don't want to have i don't i'm not there to be a dentist 
I'm there for you. I'm not asking to take anything from you. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm there to celebrate you. And so if that means if each of us has an environment about us that, that might speak to whatever fancy, that's fine. But we really need to put that aside, unless it's important for the image itself. Let's, let's get to work. I'm ready. Whatever you need for me to do, I, I'm happy to run out the door and get coffee and all that good stuff. There's a story of a fashion photographer by the name of uh, Sante Dorazio, uh, who had his first break of photographing Iman, I think for Vogue, and he flew to Paris to do it. And he's still quite young, but an amazing talent. He had studied painting under uh, Philip Perlstein. And he told me the story of traveling to Paris to photograph Iman. She was, and still is, in, in the world of fashion household name. She went on to become David Bowie's wife, but she's uh, uh, a, a very, very um, strong force to be reckoned with in that world. And so he shared this little story about humility and how to address it because uh, he had his, his assistants, his team, and he, he thought he was the big shot. Oh, look, I've been paid to get on this plane and fly to Paris now to photograph Iman. Iman walks in with her entourage, and Iman doesn't know who the photographer is. First time for that <laughs> fellow. That's good. She walks in, sees Santi Razio, and mm -hmm. says, Hey, you, run outside and get me a cup of coffee. This is how I like it. <laughs> he responds, Hi, Iman. Get your own damn coffee. I'm your photographer. My name's Sante. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. And she was shocked. She said, oh, I'm so sorry. And they embraced each other, and they went off and had a great experience. That was very bold. Again, it's respect, isn't it? But, it, but, he, but he was also very imposing and quick yep. with, with her lack of respect. Yes, exactly. Uh, on the other side of the coin is the experience of Platon, uh, who had photographed Anthony Hopkins. And that was his first big big break. He had just come out with uh, Silence of the Lambs and was on a press junket tour for it, for that experience. And Platon had to photograph him for uh, a publication in England and he was there at the time. And, and, and he, I think he was still very much living there. Uh, he was based in, 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 in London, went to the Royal Academy of Art College there. So he gets this break to photograph uh, Anthony Hopkins. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the publicist says to him, okay, Platon, your time slot is, because it's one interview and one photographer after another, your time plot slot is such and such, and good luck. You should know that he just uh, took the equipment from the photographer we just had and threw it out in the hallway. So now, of course, he's nervous as can be. Yeah. So he goes into the room. Sir Hopkins, it's a pleasure to meet you. I'm honored to make your photograph. That's great, that's great. Let's get to work. A little more nerves. Okay. Uh, Sir Hopkins, would, I, would you be so kind as to move to that side of the couch? I want you to put your weight on that side. No, I don't want to do that. Puts the camera down, and he says, Sir Hopkins, I've got to let you know, I'm aware that... According to your publicist, you've taken the equipment of that photographer and thrown it into the hallway. I'm terribly nervous to be before you right now. And if I don't have your help to make these pictures with me, I can't do my job. Hopkins replies, young man, did, I, did my publicist tell you why I did that? No, she did not. He wanted to photograph me as the monster I play in that movie. I'm not a monster. I'm a man. And I just want to be photographed as the man I am. So can we get to work? Nerves are gone. And they get to work. But that is building humility mm -hmm. while also building harmony with that person. And that's the important quality that has to go into every photo portrait experience. Mm -hmm. Do my best to make it happen when I can. There's just one more, and that's vulnerability. Maybe you could address that. Any person, be he or she or a writer, dancer, actor, filmmaker, musician, who puts that soul out to the world. Here's my novel, here's my story, here's mm -hmm. my poetry, here's my film. This is me. Criticize me. Embrace me. Whatever you're going to do, it's okay. I've decided to make myself that vulnerable. To write a memoir, these are, every, these are all the bad things I've done, these are all the good things that have come my way. These are the people I've hurt. These are the people who have loved me and despite my having hurt them. That, that is vulnerability. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to make yourself vulnerable to someone you care about on a one-to-one -on -one experience, but it's an even greater risk to make yourself vulnerable before the world for millions, potentially millions of people to receive what's most fragile about you. 
but yet that's what is what every writer does and I'm happy to be just as open again I'm, I'm I need to join up with that person horse whispering is an awful cliche verb but I, I need to be in harmony with that person to work with that person to come up with an interesting picture I'm absolutely as happy to be as open with myself as I wish that person to be with me it's the only way it's going to work as with everything in life well, and it really has worked. It's a beautiful book, and thank you for talking to me about it. Thank you so very much, Nigel. The pleasure is mine. Perhaps you could just tell me where people can get it, who published it. Author of the Portraits of Beowulf Sheehan was just published on Tuesday, October 9th. It is available in stores and online at your favorite bookstore throughout North America as of now. And uh, I would be honor, honored if you should uh, be so curious as to take a look at this book published by Black Dog and Leventhal, an imprint of Hachette Book Group in the United States. It's been no small thrill to uh, see this journey of people uh, I love and love celebrating through my work uh, compressed into this tome, and I, I would be honored for you to have a look. Thank you. Thank you.